I thought I would turn to, uh, to, to General Wald first to talk about this, and because um, General Wald is uh, on our task force with uh, Admiral Jim Stavridis and uh, on this issue of bolstering U.S.-Israel security, and uh, is actually very involved with us in general, but on this particular, <coughs> co-chairs our <coughs> MED task force, our Iran task force, but I wanted, uh, Chuck, uh, if you could talk about uh, this effort about bolstering U.S.-Israel security and uh, the mutual defense pack, and uh, the, we could talk about the front loading, and we'll talk about other things as well, but uh, I'd like to. Yeah, <coughs> excuse me, the, uh, first of all, this is really, really bad having to follow Ambassador Dermer. <laughs> Unbelievable, he's, he's impressive. That, matter of fact, I wanted to ask him, why don't you just go back and set up a government, but I guess that would have been inappropriate. Um, <laughs> So, so and I thought his viewpoint was really good on this. <clears throat> it's a, it, first of all, when we f first started the, the study, it was, it's, it's not obvious, I guess, maybe it is to you all, it wasn't to me why it would be a problem that we'd have a defense pact with Israel, why it would be a problem for Israel. Seems like a natural to me. I mean, we have one anyway, it's, uh, it's unwritten, but <clears throat> I always kind of like to have people held accountable if something goes a certain way, it's nice to know it's they're going to show up. Uh, but I look at it uh, not from the standpoint of any benefit to Israel, I guess, which we were told today why that isn't necessarily a benefit. It's the benefit to the U.S. I think we need Israel to, just like what the ambassador was talking about, they, if they're going to be, uh, which I, I'm convinced, our number one ally in the 21st century for good reason, uh, because size necessarily or volume doesn't necessarily matter as, as much as it did because of technology and some other things. But um, the one thing I will say <clears throat> that I kind of a little bit disagree, which uh, that's kind of a dangerous thing to do with the ambassador, but my feeling for Israel is based totally on values. I think we have the same exact values as Israel does and vice versa. Um, there may be some other countries in the world that are close, but I don't think there's any <clears throat> country that's uh, like Israel for us from the standpoint of what I value in the United States, what we stand for, <clears throat> what, what I hope we stand for, what we should stand for. Um, and so we have an ally in the world that has the same exact values as we do, that you should do things for the right reason, you should defend yourself, uh, you should have integrity, you, can, you should be dependable. Um, and in the Middle East, uh, he said what Mike and I have talked about a lot in the past, and that's that in the, in the beginning it was about Israel and oil was the Middle East for the U.S. And now it's uh, Israel and Iran. And the oil issue is not quite as big a deal, but it's, it's a big deal, but not as big as, say, Iran. So there's, there's still reasons for us to have huge interest in the Middle East, <clears throat> and at least of not which is is Israel. So no matter what happens with Iran, Israel's still going to be there. And Israel to me is, it, it epitomizes what we as America think we stand for and most of the time do, but probably not as purely as Israel does. They're a good example. And I think uh, when you look at why do we have, why do we value the United States as a nation? Why do Americans <clears throat> want to be who we are in America or what we stand for? Uh, Israel epitomizes that also, probably the only other country in the world. So, so I see the, the defense pact as a mutual handshake with Israel, why we should do that. And let me, uh, thank you, <clears throat> let me just step back. I realize as you're talking, to, let me give a little more context. So again, as the general said, I don't know if you remember all or uh, uh, what I said last night, but look, this idea of a mutual defense pact actually came from our task force. Uh, actually, General, uh, excuse me, Admiral Jim Stavridis, former NATO commander, it's actually a passion of his, I should say. Uh, it wasn't ours uh, necessarily. We didn't. Uh, it's not a new idea, uh, and what we and this it's been brought up for a long time, but it hasn't been brought up lately as much. And what we try to do is, uh, and there are historical reasons for that. Um, basically, on the Israeli side, there are about two or three main objections. Uh, limits freedom of action, which Israelis are very averse to. Uh, um, they're very, you know, we defend ourselves uh, by ourselves. And, um, and then there are also some who don't want to tie to any peace process concessions, I would say. 
Uh, but the, I'd say the freedom of action is probably the most, the, on the U.S. side, while we have um, mutual defense pacts with about 50 other countries, um, they haven't, we haven't had a new one in a while. And, uh, you know, certainly in recent years, certainly with this administration and the previous administration, there doesn't seem to be a lot of desire to be expanding our commitments. So wouldn't this be, why would we want to do this? Uh, we just put out now in the packet you have, do we have, uh, uh, we should have the paper on the mutual defense pack and we just put out something, which I don't know if it's in the packet because we literally just put it out yesterday on uh, addressing criticisms of the mutual defense pack. Uh, and a, a number of the criticism has come from, I would say, I would say probably the more right of center pro-Israel camp here and in Israel and General Amrik Dior could share his views. You heard Ambassador Dermer speak about it. Um, my own view is that um, America, are re Israel already, uh, while it could do it at once uh, and will continue to do what it wishes, if it's going to do something significant that's going to impact U.S. assets in the region, it's likely going to consult with the United States anyway. Oh, let me and just I, say one please, thing, though. Chuck, go ahead. <clears throat> First of all, the, the ambassador answered this. Yeah. Israel isn't going to ask ever Permission. anybody no. to do what they ever have to do to defend their country. Yeah. So I don't think that's even a worry. Two is um, the one thing Israel does need from the United States is volume of weapons, I think, <clears throat> and maybe volume of volume for size, say, bombers or whatever the case may be, maybe some tankers. Um, but uh, what we don't want to have happen is because of this kind of groundswell of uh, naivete about people criticizing Israel, if there, if there gets to be a conflict, and maybe we're not even involved yet, but Israel has to go for it, let's say against uh, Lebanon, they're going to need a volume of precision munitions, etc. And we don't want to have uh, some kind of political interference on this thing from the United States to say, well, we're going to make a value judgment here and you're not going to get the weapons because of whatever. I think we need to have something more tangible to ensure we're going to take care of Israel when the time comes yeah. from that perspective. Like in 2014 with Operation right. Protective Edge when there seemed to be a holdup of the Hellfire missiles right. from the U.S. to Israel. Uh, there are other objections. Some experts uh, worry that uh, you uh, need to have... Um, the, uh, if you're going to have a mutual defense pact, does there have to be even more sharing of information than there already is between the two sides? Uh, we heard that from some officials we've discussed with, we've discussed this already with uh, officials in the administration, and uh, we've looked into that issues and some mutual defense pact, some countries that have mutual defense pacts with the United States do share more, uh, some in, more information than others who don't. Others concern, uh, well, Israel will have to fight, you know, what, we're gonna ask Israel to fight in the Taliban in uh, Afghanistan. And the fact is, again, here again, there are mutual defense pact that actually, like in Asia, where they're geographically limited, by the by, way. By the way, yeah. <clears throat> during the um, early 2000s, uh, I mean, one minute. well, I guess around 2007 or eight, um, when it looked like Israel might be going after Iran indi indi individually or, or independently. And at that time, there were some things going on around the region that uh, most people today would be a little bit surprised at from the standpoint of who was helping and who wasn't. But we were told uh, at U European Command <laughs> to limit the amount of information we were giving the Israelis intelligence-wise because that was the way we were going to U.S., was going to uh, avoid having Iran, uh, Israel take independent action against Iran. Totally stupid. But my feeling is we want to do everything we can to avoid that from happening in the world. One last thing I'll just say, and then I want to get General Amidor's thoughts, um, is um, if you notice, and Ambassador Dermer used this word also, uh, we, our idea is a, a narrow U.S.-Israel uh, mutual defense pact, and that that's word is important because most of the the mutual defense pacts the United States has with these 50 other countries are much more expansive. And let me be very specific what I mean by that. So we say we list in our paper, which is only about five or six pages. We've also drafted a treaty. Uh, this is the 
you heard Senator Graham mention that we already wrote the treaty. Last night we did, and it's based on our work that we circulated first quietly before we published it. Senator Graham got all worked up and you know began championing this. But we talk about exceptional circumstances that it should be that would trigger such a mutual defense pact. If, for instance, the one difference between Israel, but we talk about for Israel a narrow one. What does that mean? For instance, if France got hit by missiles, that would be a big deal, right? Uh, Israel, unfortunately, gets missiles fired at it virtually every day. Uh, neither Israel would want the United States to be involved in dealing with, say, missiles from Gaza, and nor would the United States want to be involved in that. We're not talking about that. We're talking about exceptional circumstances uh, that really threaten the viability or existence of the State of Israel. And as I said last night, I think there are two elements here that are particularly helpful. I think we heard a third element from uh, Ambassador Dermer that it could be like a launching pad to even greater cooperation, uh, which we didn't mention in our paper, but I think it's a very good point. But ours, we talk about deterrence, add a layer of deterrence, and I think it could help mitigate a, con a serious war if one actually breaks out, because an adversary such as Iran would see that the United States is even bound together. And um, I think that uh, where we've had mutual defense pacts, they've been a source for stability. And uh, that's why we think it's a, it'd be a valuable thing for the United States. And I also, while it wasn't the impetus for this, um, I do worry that this will become much more political since we originally were re working on this idea in the last year and a half. And I think it would be good to kind of solidify that relationship uh, sooner, better than later. All right, I'll turn to General Amidjo to get his thoughts on this, then we'll turn to the other issue of uh, front-loading. Okay, first, two um, remarks. Um, my good friend, the ambassador, spoke about the, why Israel is important for the, for the United States of America in the 21st century. And I believe that Israel will be even more important if the trend of pulling out from the Middle East will continue the Americans will remain with only one solid, stabilized place uh, in the Middle East, and this is Israel. And the more the Americans are pulling out from the Middle East, Israel is becoming more important for the future security of the United States of America. Um, and this is something that you have to learn because it's a new phenomena for you. You are less depends on the Middle East. You are pulling out of the Middle East. What might be the consequences for the long range um, avoiding uh, Middle East um, uh, interference of the Americans? What if worse comes to worst and one day you will have to come back to the Middle East and you will find that Israel is the only um, stable place in, from which you can begin something in the Middle East. I think it's a very important change in the whole structure of the relations and, and together we have to um, explore to find how can we um, enhance the relations between the two states. In spite the fact that you are leaving the area and the truth is that because the fact that you are leaving the area. This is one remark. The second one is about the cooperation of today. Today cooperation between the military systems and the intelligence community is the best that we had. It's, it was built slowly, slowly. It was enhanced during the previous administration, but much better in this present administration. In every aspect of cooperation you, you can imagine, and some of the issues you cannot be imagined because you wouldn't believe that, that we are doing together. And I think it's a very important to understand it's, it's the, the whole idea of a new um, pact is not coming based on the uh, you know, um, empty uh, area uh, of cooperation. On the, on the contrary, it's based on a very strong cooperation in all levels. And I'm really surprised what, what I learned about the cooperation and myself, although I'm involved in this cooperation for I don't remember how many years. Um, about the, 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 the new agreement, I belong to the 
more cautious side of the Israeli establishment relating to this agreement. If worst come to worst, and someone in America one day will have a better tool to put pressure on Israel because of this agreement, I think that we should not sign it. And this is the way to look at it, not from the positive side or not only from the positive side, and to ask yourself, okay, a good administration for Israel, with good sentiment to Israel, what can they build based on the new agreement and how it will enhance the relations and will make the life of those who want to um, cooperate even more, more cooperation between Israel and the United States of America. This is not the, the right way to look at it, or not the only way to look at it. We have to ask ourselves the question if will be a negative um, process here, and someone who dislikes Israel, will the language of the agreement will help to put more pressure on Israel or to um, narrow the space of, of um, Israel independence and so on and so forth. And this is the, the, the main issue. At the end of the day, Israel resumed the address. It was very well explained by Ron. The raison d'etre of Israel is the Israelis want to defend themselves by themselves, to make all the mistakes by ourselves, and to be ready to sacrifice whatever is needed. And we don't want to be in a position in which someone will say you have an agreement so you can trust America, so give up that or give up that. And this is why at the end of the day, it is very much depends on the language of this agreement. And and we should be very cautious. It's easy to think that a positive administration will use it to enhance the relations. It's not as easy to elaborate and to assess what a negative um, administration might use uh, based on the same language of the same agreement. So I think that the key name or the key word in this process is narrow, to find where to narrow it and how to prevent any misuse of this um, agreement in the future. And we learn as a state to be prepared for the worst and not, for the, not only for the, for the best. And, and this is the way to judge the, the, the agreement in the process, to go through the letter by letter and to see what can be prevented by changing languages and what should be neglected and pushed away because it might be used. And at the end, the narrow it will be, the better. Let me pick up on, uh, thank you, General. Uh, let me pick up on some of the transition to the other thing, which is also some that Chuck raised, and we'll get into detail about it. But let me ask you, you mentioned, I agree with you, that um, the United States is uh, at least perceived as withdrawing. They have a, we have a real credibility issue, certainly in the region. Uh, I think the inaction against Iranian attacks, for, especially after Apgate, and then this uh, agreement with Turkey that enabled them to uh, go into um, northern Syria at the expense of our Kurdish allies, just for recent example. Given that, and the Israelis are the only ones that are really hitting the Iranians and trying to actually roll them back on a regular basis, including just the other day. So given that, what sort of, what do you think would be useful? And I'll talk about what Jins has suggested on this, that Chuck and I have never, what do you think would be useful? How could, we're more reliant on Israel effectively. Our objective hasn't changed. But what do you think is important of ways for the United States to help Israel, not only advance its own defense, but advance US interests in the region? I think the, the stronger Israel means that you will have to invest less in the Middle East. The ability of Israel to solve the problem by itself, that if we be in a position to contain the Iranians in Syria, it means at the end that you will not have to be involved and to invest in Syria. You will be in a better position to find a solution without sending your forces into Syria because it will be understood that without an agreement with America, which is going hand with hand with, the, with Israel, 
Nothing in Syria can be solved because Israel is very active in Syria. This is only two examples of how you can um, get much more benefits from stronger Israel. And I'm not speaking about the obvious, the fact that we are providing each other intelligence which is essential to both sides. And, and I don't know if someone will count the, the amount of intelligence that you are getting from us and the amount of intelligence that we are getting from you, who will be in a, in a, in a better position uh, in, this, uh, in this case. I'm, I'm not sure and I'm very cautious because I, I think that we are in, in, in here we have a, a problem of um, credit and deficit. Um, I'm speaking about the fact that stronger Israel in the Middle East will save America a lot of energy and um, need to invest because many issues can be achieved by uh, a stronger Israel um, and you will not have to add your efforts to, to that. The fact that America is losing credibility, it's bad for Israel because everyone understands the, the, the strong relations between the two states and when America has a credibility, it's easier for us to deal with problems in the Middle East. But we understand that at the end of the day, uh, we cannot build on your credibility. We have to build our credibility. And maybe when you come back and you will have a need to uh, be uh, involved in the Middle East, you will use our credibility as part of your assets. Hmm. That's interesting. Uh, now, we've, um, one thing that Jens and I mentioned it last night, uh, if we propose is trying to accelerate delivery of weapons to Israel. One thing that when General Wald and I and uh, Admiral Stavridis and some other generals and uh, Jonathan Rui and our staff um, uh, went to Israel initially, about this issue, it was almost two years ago, but, uh, and, and, and in subsequent meetings that uh, we've had, uh, certainly I've had with senior IDF leadership, it's clear to me that they really feel the need, they, have a, they feel a real weapons deficit right now, and that the MOU, which is terrific, it's not going to bring the, enough weapons fast enough. So we've recommended certain financing ways to try just, I'm gonna ask General Wald about some of the specifics, but before I do, I, I would like to hear your thoughts. And I, by the way, I'll add that without adding $1 more burden to the US taxpayer, that's been something we've been very clear at, this financing, we're not asking for additional uh, assistance. But I, I, I want to explain what is the basis for the, for the um, a bit of kind of a stress in the, in the military establishment in Israel. We are, after 70 years when, with which we, we cope with the Arab countries around us, and very successfully, and we build kind of a military qualitative edge, which is better today than 30 years ago. We, we use the American money and Israel taxpayer money together to build a system which is very successful to deal with the um, Arab um, threats, including um, Hezbollah and Hamas and so on and so forth. Military-wise, military we are in good position to deal with those threats. The fact that Iran is much more involved in Iran through the nuclear project and around Israel through Hezbollah and the independent war machine in Syria and, and more involvement in, in Gaza and so on and so forth. We will speak about it in the next session. Brought the military establishment to understanding that we have to add something to the ability of Israel to, to cope with the problem. The, the problem is different. We have an enemy which is more than um, 2,500 kilometers away. We have a new um, enemy which is very sophisticated in his uh, cyber um, capabilities. We have an enemy which is, um, which build around Israel um, organizations like um, Hezbollah and Hamas with 
100,000 rockets and missiles and, and anti-air new uh, missiles and so on and so forth, broaden the area in which Israel we have, will have to cope with, very long targeting um, goals because of the involvement of Iran itself. So we have to build capabilities that we didn't have in the past. For example, we are much more depends on air fuel than in the past, because if you have to go somewhere behind the horizon, it's, 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 it's badly needed. To build these capabilities, we need, we argue between ourselves, but we need something between two to four billion dollar. Um, some will say five million billion dollar, but this is, th these are the numbers. From that came the uh, idea to accelerate the financing of the MOU, which was for the next 10 years. And I, understand, I fully understand the need. I was even involved in the producing the numbers. But from a business point of view, I'm not sure that this is the wise step to take. And it is not about the principle. The principle I just explained, yes, they are right. They have to accelerate the capability and then to continue with the same uh, slope. What is the problem? The problem is if that will be accelerated and in the next five years or four years we will get the financing of the 10 years, we will remain without ability to finance any need in the last five years of this decade, because all the money will come now. What was so good in the MOU with it we liked very much and we decided to sign, although some people in Washington and Jerusalem spoke about the next administration, wait, blah, 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 blah. What was very good is that the notion and the knowledge and the understanding that we have a strict financing plan for the next 12 years. It's the 10 years of the MOU and the last two years of the previous MOU. And we have line of financing, you, have to, you can make plans that by itself you save a lot of money. You can plan for 12 years. It's a lot. By accelerating it, you lose the, the flexibility after the five, the first five years. And, and I'm not speaking about the principle, just from, the, from my private uh, experience in the, in the business. You need to keep the flexibility if something will happen in the, in the future. And you cannot invest all your money, and this is what is, uh, uh, what is the, the, the essence of this proposal, is to invest all the money that you have in the next four years without an answer to the question what you will do if you have a crisis in the seventh year or the eighth. You, you don't have the money anymore. And I think that before making such a decision, we have to think twice. We have to think if we want to sacrifice the flexibility of the next five years, of the last five years of the decade for having better capability in the first five years. I'm not sure that it is wise. You know, I, I just, uh, first of all, <clears throat> I wouldn't argue with you because it's your country and you're, you're, you're at stake. But um, so quantity has a quality of its own. And the, the differentiator between 2006 and now is probably 60,000 missiles, maybe more. I mean, I've heard you, the experts over to my right, but 120,000 missiles in Lebanon, that's a lot. So I, I love the Israeli technology for the layered defenses against missiles. Brilliant. It's best by far in the world. <clears throat> the problem is that it's not going to take care of 120,000. They're not going to be all shot at once, but it's going to be continuous for... Mm -hmm. So, so me, from a military risk standpoint, I would say I want to hedge my bets up front because we could have war tomorrow. Yeah. 
It could happen, you know, within the first five years. It may happen after that too. But but if I were, uh, if I'm not Israel, but if I were, I'd go for quantity and quality now to make sure if something started happening because it's going to be a if if Lebanon um, if you get attacked from Lebanon in the next X number of days or years, it's going to be a all-out, no kidding, really voluminous battle. Uh, and you're going to need to go back and revisit and revisit and revisit for a while and expend a lot of munitions. And it's unfortunately, you can't protect everything in Israel, but you're going to do better than Hezbollah believes. And so you got to build that uh, assurance in there. And then, if you spend all $30 billion in the first five years, we'll give you some more later. I mean, if it's really a threat, the United States will come through. I mean, that's a, that's a risk. It's a bet. Um, but, I, but I wouldn't risk now, is what I'm saying. I, wouldn't t- I, I would eliminate the risk now, or at least give myself the best chance now. I, I would, uh, and then we're going to go to questions in a second, but um, when I was in Israel in September, I was struck. I met a number of senior IDF generals. Uh, one in particular struck me was that um, said to me that uh, they feel, or he, this particular general felt uh, the situation in the region gotten worse over the, pre- over the last six months. And uh, I think it's partly because of the inaction against Iran and so on. And there, I felt the real sense of urgency on the Israeli side. We felt it when we were there even together over, over a year and a half ago. But one of the weapons, the, the systems that we've talked about is, uh, and it's a shame that General Leitch isn't here because he was the defense, at, Israeli defense attache uh, who, neg- who was, the point, was one of the point people on the MOU that was negotiated. And before that, he was head of, he was a J3, he was head of IDF operations. Uh, and he worked very closely with us on these papers. But um, if General Walt, if you just talk about, because the Air Force, I, I, we didn't introduce <coughs> Chuck because I think we introduced him before, but I, Forced our Air Force Deputy Comm Commander at the Air War in, uh, in Afghanistan. Do you find what we talk about precision guided missiles, KC 46s? Uh, well, it's a combination you know, of things. Yeah, we were talking with uh, John Wax, or Charles Wax, earlier about this. Yeah. I, I mistook his name tag for mine, sat in this spot last <laughs> night. But, but anyway, um, explain if, if it's Iran, it's a little different because of the distance, as the general mentioned. To, um, the, the let's just say there. it was, it is Iran. That, that's the issue about going after. There's distance, which takes time, which takes, you can't carry as you can't get as many airplanes over the target area as, as fast as you could, say, into Lebanon. And then you, there's certain weapons in, um, you're going to need in Iran, weapons that penetrate hard and deep and buried targets, they call it, because of uh, the way the Iranians have buried some of their assets. The other thing is that it's the big hand little map theory. For those that haven't heard that, if you, if you look at a map and you start talking about Afghanistan, you look, well, that isn't very big. You know, it's as big as France. You just don't fly across there real quick. And the same thing to, to Iran. It's, you got to go all the way across Saudi Arabia and across the Persian Gulf and then into Iran, and you got to penetrate into Iran. <clears throat> and number two is the targets are dispersed all over the place. And they have weapons uh, uh, systems against penetrating aircraft. So you, so you got all those combinations of you need to do a whole bunch of targets over a very period, short period of time. They've got to penetrate uh, into the earth, uh, assuming you have the intel, which I think Israeli intel is as good as it gets and with some help from others. But then you probably need things that carry a lot of bombs at quite a distance and have the penetration capability, and some big ones. Some of these 15,000 pound penetrators, and you can't carry those on a fighter. You don't have B-2s in Israel. Probably need more tankers. Probably need help from some of your neighbors to land. And you need a whole bunch of bombs and you can't do it all at one time because there's too many targets. So you, you start getting into, okay, do I want to send a signal, which you could do that, Israel can send a signal real easy. There's no doubt in my mind they could go over and do something in Iran uh, and send a real signal. The problem is, can you put them back where they're not a, re- a threat? And can you put them down, their, their capability? So once you start with Iran bombing, you got to go for it. You got to get rid of all their capabilities. So you need volume, you need distance, you need penetration, uh, and that isn't there. And for all those uh, missiles, uh, launchers, and rocket launchers in Lebanon, 
the precision guided missiles uh, important for that? Lebanon's different, you know. They don't, I mean, they have tunnels and stuff over in Gaza, but it isn't like Iran and Lebanon. They're in buildings. Uh, the general talked about this earlier. Um, it would be, from a targeting uh, vulnerability standpoint, it would be easier, you know. <laughs> um, you get, get the S-400 is a problem. But the, the Israelis know how to take care of that. Um, it's a more concentrated area. It's, uh, you can fly a whole bunch of fast sorties because it's only, you know, 150 miles isn't very far in an airplane. Um, and so uh, the, dis the problem there is them firing off a whole bunch of missiles all at one time. You can't take care of all that. But once they've uh, shot the missiles, it's over. Uh, so you can, you, can, you can defend the Lebanese pretty easy, assuming um, the Israelis were given the, the ability to hit targets that might be in an area that could be uh, high collateral damage uh, potential. And that's what happened in 2006, because the generals already alluded to that. But if Israel's uh, it's, existential threat to Israel out of Hezbollah happens, that's, that's secondary. Israel survives first. So there'll be some, some collateral, but Israel can take care of the Lebanon problem. There'll be some damage in Israel, but uh, Israel will prevail. Iran's different. Di long distance, hardened bearing deep targets, dispersed targets, better, more air defense. So you'd have to do it in an incremental way. First thing I'd do against Iran is I'd go in and take out the, all their Navy right off the bat, and I'd start taking out their air defenses. That takes time, and you do it via different methods. Um, they're not going to sneak away, probably, because they're hard and deep and buried, so you can take a little more time. <laughs> time is of the essence in Lebanon, not quite as much in, in Iran, the diff there's, so there's differences. So for Iran, I think, um, I don't think Israel will want to go after Iran without the U.S., frankly. I think in Lebanon, they don't have any choice. They do it, so they need volume up there. Any questions? And, uh, we'll over. John? Oh, Joel, sorry, do you have a question? Oh, um, I was going to ask uh, General Amador, uh, when you're speaking about um, the need to be cautious about the, uh, the uh, the agreement between the, the U.S. and um, and Israel uh, with, respect, with respect to the monies in the MOU. I'm wondering if Israel couldn't just fund finance um, the MOU, bring it forward by funding it, uh, by financing it, say, in Europe with low-cost debt. Um, and bringing it forward without having to actually bring it forward. Uh, I, I make myself understood. You can, you can, you can borrow the amounts you yes, need. Yes, but the end you have to pay yeah. to pay it back. Say again. This is about debts. I learned that about debts. At, at the end, you you have to pay it back. Well, you pay it back with the funds you get from the MOU. You're bringing it forward. By borrowing in okay, Europe, but, interest uh, but rates the question remains: You don't have money to finance new uh, needs in the United States of America because you you use the money to pay the debts. I, wh Not what worried sure me that. is that after five years, uh, that we will have fantastic capabilities, as was um, understood here. Uh, we will buy whatever is needed, and then we will have to use the money. For of the last five years to pay the debts of the first five years. What will happen if we need to buy something new in America? Because there was a crisis, new technology, I don't know what. No one knows. Well, what you, you, lose, you lose the, the, the flexibility and you don't have a buffer. You will land on an empty area. I, I, under, I, under, I understand, but what, you're, what I'm inferring from what you say is that we're going to need more than the MOU provides. If, if you ask me, and this is politically, we should not touch the MOU. 
The MEU was signed by President Obama. We might find many enemies for the continuation of the MOU years ahead. Keep it as it was signed by President Obama. Don't touch it. Don't give excuse to those who want to use it against Israel in the future. <clears throat> if there is a way to finance Israel out of the MOU, above the MOU, not connected to the MOU, and you will find a good way to do it, this is something to consider. Don't touch the MOU. Yep. The, the, uh, <laughs> the, just kind of being flippant. If, if Israel treated debt like we do, you wouldn't care. <laughs> uh, but, but, not, but, but in all seriousness, um, another alternative, which we've talked about, which I think should be advocated, is that the United States preposition our own yeah. weapons in Israel at a high volume. And by the way, we'll have access to them if we need to against anybody, but they'll be there for the Israelis as well. To me, that's a, another solution that answers the mail. If I could clarify on that. This is a good one. Yeah, right. so we talk about, we mentioned that in our report, by the it way. It serves both sides' right. needs, and it's a good, it's, just, it's a good just, idea. Just to clarify, we, we mentioned this on the report. I'm glad you brought up, Chuck, because I didn't. And uh, the U.S. does have prepositioned weapons. The issue is, is that they're outdated. Uh, there aren't precision guided missiles, which the Israelis desperately need to hit all these launchers in Lebanon and so on. So it is to really replenish the preposition. You know, during the um, updated Obama administration, we talked to Susan Rice one time about providing uh, the, uh, the Saudis with precision weapons. That was a punishment that the U.S. pulled on the Saudis because they didn't like what they were doing in Yemen. And I mentioned this uh, NSA advisor Rice. I said it's kind of ironic that you would take away precision weapons because they're you want because the Saudis are killing civilians. We're going to give them dumb weapons so they can kill more of them. <laughs> and um, so what people miss is kind of going back to what uh, you mentioned or Mike mentioned. Some of these weapons are outdated. They just aren't as good as they were. You know. And so you not only need lots of them. You need new ones and precision, and you need some penetrators and. It's the type of weapons. We should prepo those there, and it's a good hedge for us. It's great for Israel. And we address in this report, which I encourage you to read, is uh, there is a production capacity challenge here in the United States on precision guided missiles. Uh, the United States military would like to have more. By, by the way, at the beginning of Bosnia, or Kosovo, I should say, in 99, uh, the U.S. almost ran out of joint direct attack munitions because we hadn't been producing them at the volume we needed. It's a big deal, and you, you remember this. <clears throat> and so you just don't make these things like toilet paper, Charles Wax, wherever you are. Um, the, you know, you, it takes volume, it takes uh, production lines, it takes, uh, they're pretty sophisticated. Anyway. But well, we uh, make some recommendations how to address uh, that issue. Look, um, we could, uh, one last question, then we're gonna, yeah. So it can't be misinterpreted. I mean, that's an impossible task in this day and age, it seems to me. What do you all, how does the task force deal with the interpretation issue so that at some future time, the United States doesn't put undue pressure on Israel to do something? Because from what he said, I don't see how you can approve the uh, mutual defense agreement. To put on, I'm sorry, what's the question? To I, th I think uh, the ambassador answered this pretty well today. I thought when he, the, the biggest point that I took away, a lot of them, he was fantastic, by the way, but uh, people are going to do what's in their best interest. I don't care if you got a treaty or not. Yeah. Now, so if, if it's something that you're going to have to live with that be, and you don't really like, then it's probably not an existential threat to you that you've complied with it. If there's a real threat to Israel, don't worry. The Israeli, you, your government, your military is going to take care of it. I don't care what kind of treaty you're in. And I would just live with that. 